Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the major events of the Warhammer universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. And today, as it is still August, and as close as I get to a rest period until January, we shall continue with some entries that I feel are important, but that certainly do not require a rewrite. As I always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But first, possibly the most important advert I will ever put on this channel, for it is a matter close to my heart. Let's do this. Are you the first to know it's raining? Do you fear going into the loft or attic in case of low hanging supports? Will you always fear the snow and be forced to wear a hat? When your father gives you armies to finish off a job, do you instantly rebel and try to take his place as ruler of the galaxy? If any of this is true, then you are probably bald. Now some might consider it cool, rugged, or macho, but let me tell you the truth about hair. When you have lost it all, you will use any excuse to prop up your shattered self-image, even growing a goatee and pretending it was a choice. Even worshipping the dark gods seems like a good idea some days. It is too late for me. But it isn't too late for you, and you do have a choice, because you can turn to Keeps, the online subscription service that cares as much about your hair as you do about your ball and um, self-respect. They offer clinically proven treatments to combat the symptoms of hair loss. Treatments are delivered straight to customers' doors. Treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. And all treatment plans are personalized and doctor recommended. You also get a full year of unlimited doctor messaging for support. Many can see results in just six months, but obviously nothing is guaranteed. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth within reason, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% of your first order, go to keeps.com slash Baldemort or click the link in the description. Bye, you fools. If you don't want to become evil, don't become bald. And contact Keeps today. Warzone Pandarax The Pandarax incursion took place between year 959 and 961 Millennium 41, when a Black Legion warfleet invaded the Pandarax system and captured the Imperial planet of Pythos. Hidden beneath this planet's surface was a portal to the warp known as the Damnation Cache which Abaddon used to unleash a demonic legion upon the world. A ferocious campaign was fought by Imperial forces to recapture Pythos and close down the Damnation Cache, first in the depths of space and then on the demon-infested surface of Pythos itself. The Invasion of Pythos In 959 Millennium 41, a Black Legion incursion fleet invaded the Imperial plant of Pythos in the Pandarax system. The fleet was commanded by Abaddon the Despoiler himself and consisted of half a dozen massive battleships, each one with enough firepower to lay waste to an entire planet, supported by numerous escort craft. The incursion fleet contemptuously swept aside Pandarax's system defense craft and moved into orbit above the planet of Pythos within hours of entering the system. What Abaddon could possibly want from Pythos was by no means clear at this time. The planet was an inhospitable death world, 
home to a colony of hardy imperial citizens. Most of Pythos is covered in dense jungle, which is home to masses saurian creatures happy to eat anything that moves. The oceans are inhabited by equally large predators. Because of the dangers of moving through the lowlands and across the oceans, the human settlers of Pythos, clustered in mountaintop mining colonies known locally as Delver strongholds. From these, they derived a precarious and meagre existence, mining the precious minerals found in the planet's mountainous chains. Hundreds of these strongholds were scattered over the planet, each home to a population of only a few thousand imperial citizens. Pythos's only major city was the hive port of Attica, which was located on the coast of the planet's largest ocean and surrounded on its landward side by the aptly named Death Glades. Attica was a small spire city, with its main habitation zones located in the dome-like upper levels of the city, high above the surrounding swamplands. Travel between Attica and the Delver strongholds was carried out in dilapidated, lighter-than-air dirigibles known as sky barges, lumbering through the skies high above the ferocious creatures that inhabited the lowlands in relative safety. This, then, was the bleak environment which Abaddon found at Pythos. Within moments of entering orbit, his war fleet unleashed a pinpoint barrage, quickly disabling Attica's defences and blasting the bastions and barracks occupied by the city's defence forces. Blood-red rain started pouring from the skies, and the massive capital ships of the Chaos Fleet launched scores of Dreadclaw drop pods, which disgored hundreds of Chaos Space Marines. Dozens of squads of corn berserkers supported by hunting packs of forge fiends led the assault, slaughtering the defences in a mausoleum of gore. Surprised, demoralised, and having already suffered heavy casualties, Attica's defenders broke almost at first contact. The only formation able to organise any kind of effective resistance was the 183rd Katachan Jungle Fighters Regiment, stranded on the planet while en route to the Maelstrom, and even they were only able to hold out for a few hours before being forced to conduct a fighting retreat and escaping into the surrounding swamplands. Within 36 hours of Abaddon's arrival, Attica was claimed in the name of the Dark Gods. The Blood March The Catachen jungle fighters that had escaped the city were forced to battle their way through Pythos's predator-infested jungles, harried all the way by Black Legion murder squads. It is unlikely that any other Imperial Guard troops could have survived such a march, and even the Catachans suffered dreadfully throughout the ordeal. Battling their way past ambushes, fighting off attacks by massive reptilian monsters and voracious man-eating plants, the Catachans finally reached the relative safety of the Olympax mountain range, just 150 miles to the east of Attica. Here, they based themselves from all-out attack by the Black Legion. Mysteriously, however, they were allowed time to regroup. Although the Black Legion continued to harry the Catachans, no serious attack on them was undertaken, and this gave the Imperial forces time to link up with each other. Although the largest concentration of Imperial troops had been located at Attica, all of the Delver strongholds had their own garrisons and, in aggregate, these troops numbered in the tens of thousands. Colonel Deathstrike, commander of the 183rd Regiment, and now de facto Imperial Governor of Pythos, quickly began to organize these widely scattered forces, using commandeered sky barges to gather a sizable army at his base camp in the Olympiax Mountains. Within a fortnight, he began planning offensive operations against the Chaos Invaders of what he now considered to be his planet. The Damnation Cache what Colonel Strike could not possibly know was that Abaddon had been far from idle. Unbeknownst to any of the Imperial citizens on the planet, 
Attica was built atop a hellish gateway known as the Damnation Cache. This gateway was a small but terrifyingly stable portal into the warp, through which demonic legions could travel into the material realm. Once it was captured, Abaddon would be able to summon forth a tide of wrathful demons to overwhelm the remaining defenders of Pythos and threaten the hundreds of Imperial planets nearby. In the dark days of the Horus Heresy, vast numbers of demons had emerged from the Damnation Cache to fight against those who had remained loyal to the Emperor. Following Horus's defeat, the Damnation Cache was sealed, and in the centuries that followed, it disappeared from history. Only the demon-hunting Grey Knights retained any knowledge of the portal. So it was that when Pythos was reclaimed as an Imperial colony in Millennium 33, none but the Grey Knights, the Chaos Guards, and the few surviving Chaos Space Marines that had fought there in the Heresy knew of the horrors hidden beneath the planet's surface. However, Abaddon was one of those Traitor Legion veterans, and immediately upon his arrival on Pythos, he began the task of breaking through the wards that had been set on that infernal gateway thousands of years before. Disabling the wards was no easy task, Dozens of Abaddon's most powerful sorcerers struggled to weaken the seals, sacrificing hundreds of Attica citizens in bloody rituals of unbinding as they did so. One by one, the ancient bindings broke, until finally, just over a month after Abaddon's warfleet had first appeared in the system, the last ward was broken and the damnation cache was unsealed. Immediately, the portal into the warp reopened, and a tide of demons gushed through, rampaging out of Attica across the planet, and surging towards Colonel Strike's composite army. This time, the Catachans and their PDF allies were at least at combat readiness, but nothing, nothing, could have prepared them for the tidal wave of destruction that the opening of the Damnation Cache had released. A desperate struggle erupted on the lower slopes of Mount Olympax, as wave after wave of demonic creatures crashed against the bastions and defense lines of Colonel Strike's camp. Only great heroics and terrible sacrifice prevented the base from being overrun in the first assault. Even so, it was clear to Colonel Strike that defending the newly established base camp could only result in the destruction of his entire command. Huddled together in a single location, they were an easy target, for the overwhelming hordes of demons pouring forth from the damnation cache. Bitterly, Colonel Strike ordered the troops under his command to split up and retreat to the hundreds of delve of strongholds that were located all over Pythos. He knew that while no single settlement could resist attack, the sheer number of strongholds and their scattered location offered the best chance of some Imperial forces surviving until reinforcements arrived. If, that was, reinforcements arrived at all. Battlefleet Demeter Although Abaddon's initial attack had been terrifyingly swift, he could not stop all messages calling for aid from being transmitted. High atop Attica, the desperate defenders had been able to hold out long enough for an astropathic distress signal to be sent streaking through the Immaterium. Despite the efforts of covens of Chaos Sorcerers aboard Abaddon's flagship, the Black Legion were unable to block all of these signals, which continued to be broadcast until bloodthirsty assault squads of corn berserkers were finally able to smash their way into the astropathic chamber in Attica's central spire. The Pandorax system lies a short distance to the galactic south of the Maelstrom in the Demeter Sector. Lying so close to Huron Blackheart's realm meant the Demeter Sector was in high state of battle readiness and could react to the attack quickly. Immediately upon receiving the distress call, the closest reserve fleet in the Sector was ordered to the Pandorax system. Meanwhile, Transport was arranged for the 19th and 27th Imperial Guard armies as the massive resources of the Imperium swung into operation 
to repel Abaddon's invasion. Battlefleet Demeter's reserve fleet was under the command of Lord Admiral Orson Cranswar, aboard his flagship, the Revenge. He was highly experienced, having fought numerous actions against Red Corsairs raiding fleets, though his background would offer little benefit against the overwhelming force of battle-scarred opposition he would encounter in the Pandarax system. Over the coming weeks and months, his fleet would fight in some of the largest space battles since the Gothic Campaign. The first omen of what Battlefleet Demeter would have to endure in the coming months occurred as soon as the fleet entered the Pandarax system. The 129th Imperial Destroyer Squadron was ranging ahead of the main fleet and had just begun to pick its way through the asteroid belt that fringed the outer reaches of the star system. As they did so, they were subjected to a lightning-fast attack by Iconoclast destroyers hidden in the belt. Two Imperial ships were lost, and the Chaos Squadron escaped unharmed, disappearing amidst the dense asteroid belt just minutes after launching their attack. Kranzwar first established a base on the tiny planet of Gaia, located on the edge of the Pandarax system. With his lines of communication secure, he then began to mount a series of raids and attacks into the asteroid field, intent on clearing a path to Pythos. In the following weeks, a series of increasingly brutal conflicts were fought in and around the asteroid belt, earning it the nickname of the Adamantium Fields, due to the myriad hulls of wrecked ships that floated there. At first, the ships of Abaddon's fleet held the upper hand, inflicting heavy losses on the Imperial flotillas as they repeatedly attempted to pick a way through the asteroid belt. However, in the long run, this was a campaign Abaddon could not hope to win, as the material superiority of his adversary and the willingness of the Imperium to accept stunning losses to break through to Pythos slowly but surely eroded the strength of the Chaos Fleet. Slowly the tide began to turn, and Abaddon was forced to commit ever more ships to holding Kranzwar in check. It was at this point that Abaddon received vital assistance in the form of a raiding fleet of Red Corsairs. None can say if this came about because Abaddon and Huron Blackheart had agreed to aid each other, or simply because the Red Corsairs were drawn to the Pandarax system by the lure of conflict. Just as the giant megalashark of the Pythosian oceans is drawn to injured prey by the scent of blood in the water. In any case, the outcome was the same. Combining their strength, the Chaos Fleet swiftly drove the Imperial ships out of the Adamantium fields and back towards their base at Gaia. As they did so, the dispersed squadrons of ships belonged to the two sides gathered for a final space battle of such scale that it will be remembered for a hundred generations. The Battle of Pandarax, year 960, millennium 41. Lord Admiral Cranswar knew that he was in a dangerous position. Although the number of escort vessels under his command roughly matched those in the combined Chaos fleets, he was heavily outgunned and outnumbered in terms of capital ships. The only real advantage he held lay in the number of fast attack craft he had. The launcher bays of the Revenge and Stalwart gave him a two to one advantage over those carried by the Chaos ships. In order to maximize this strength, Cranswar decided to hold the Revenge and Stalwart back, while the rest of his ships advanced to engage the Chaos fleet. While the bulk of his ships tried to keep the Chaos Fleet at arm's length, his two carriers would launch successive waves of attack craft, tasked with overwhelming the squadrons defending the Chaos ships and inflicting as much damage as possible. Hopefully, by the time the two fleets came to grips properly, the attack craft would have wreaked enough destruction to even the odds in the ensuing gun battle. Unfortunately for Cranswar, while his plan was strategically sound, it lacked guile. Although Abaddon was still on Pythos, 
commanding the ground campaign, his chosen lieutenant, Chaos Warlord Malgar Irongrasp, was a veteran of hundreds of space battles, and had guessed what Cranswar's strategy was likely to be, even before his sensors picked up the positions of the ships in the Imperial battle fleet. Iron grass ships tore forth from the adamantium fields like a battering ram, striking straight towards the heart of Cranswar's leading flotillas, smashing through the screen of Imperial attack craft. They gave Cranswar's ships no time to carry out the dainty maneuvers that he had transmitted to his command. A furious close-range battle erupted as the Chaos Fleet ploughed in amongst the ships of the Imperial Advance Guard, their immense rippling broadsides illuminating their flanks. Hundreds of attack craft swirled and battled across the miles-long capital ships, while squadrons of escort vessels engaged in deadly close-range gunnery battles. Cranswar desperately ordered his ships to disengage. Although they had suffered heavy damage, they had given as good as they had gotten, and if he could just buy enough time to rearm and refuel his now depleted attack craft, the battle could still be won. The Imperial ships executed Cranswar's orders with a stoicism brought through many long hours of careful training. The Imperial capital ships, screened by their escorts, broke away from the Chaos fleet, while the surviving attack craft headed back to the Revenge and Stalwart to rearm. However, Iron Grasp had foreseen this reaction too. Unnoticed at the back of the Chaos Warfleet, the might of Huron, a slaughter-class cruiser, fired up the huge thruster arrays which defined ships of that infamous class, and powered full speed ahead towards the Imperial carrier ships to the rear of the Imperial formation. Mysteriously, its tractors dragged a huge asteroid along behind it. The purpose of the asteroid was revealed, as the might of Huron closed with their revenge and stalwart. The interior of the massive rock was hollowed, and inside were hidden scores of Black Legion and Red Corsair boarding parties. Supported by Dreadclaw assault pods and short-range orbital flyers, as it neared the revenge, the might of Huron released the asteroid, which drifted directly towards the Imperial craft. As soon as it was close enough, tractor beams inside the asteroid grappled the Imperial battleship, and chanting covens of Chaos Sorcerers loosed a barrage of psychic attacks that tore down the Imperial ship's defensive shields and blinded its short-range batteries. As soon as the Revenge's energy shields went down, hundreds of assault pods were launched at the now defenseless craft, and a massive boarding action erupted amidst their launch bays and corridors of the ship. The Chaos Space Marines and the boarding parties were quickly reinforced by hosts of horrifying demons, which poured from warp portals that began appearing all across the ship. Within moments, the Revenge was engulfed in a furious battle. Leaving the boarding parties to deal with the Revenge, the might of Huron went after the Stalwart, which was ill-suited to a close-range gun battle with the heavily armed Chaos craft. At a stroke, Warlord Irongrasp had turned the tables on the Imperial fleet, negating any advantage the Imperial attack craft might have given them, and leaving them fatally split. Meanwhile, the rest of the Chaos fleet was able to concentrate on crushing the ships of Cranswar's advance guard. Once these ships were destroyed, Irongrasp could finish off the Revenge and Stalwart, if anything remained after the brutal pummeling each was sustaining. As Admiral Cranswar took personal command of one of the security battalions, he knew that his command was almost certainly doomed to destruction. He offered his soul to the immortal Emperor, for it would take a miracle to save his fleet. A Rock and a Hard Place It was at this vital juncture that the navigators in both fleets began picking up signs of an opening in the warp. Indications that one or more ships were just about to jump into the system. The navigators could hardly believe their senses. Appearing this close to a planetary body was almost suicidal. Nonetheless, the senses did not lie. Where one moment there was nothing, in the next moment 
four capital ships and half dozen escort craft blinked into existence. As seconds later, an eleventh, impossibly vast craft appeared, one that dwarfed even the asteroid Iron Grasp had used to attack the Revenge. This mighty vessel was the Rock. At the moment of darkest despair, the Dark Angels had arrived. As the Rock and its escorting craft moved to engage the main strength of the Chaos Fleet, the Dark Angels' battle barge unrelenting fury and three hunter-class escorts swept towards the stricken revenge. Closing quickly, Unrelenting Fury launched a volley of boarding torpedoes towards the Chaos Asteroid. Just as they struck, a phalanx of Terminators teleported onto the rocky surface of the planetoid, their pale armor a beacon against a dark bulk. This was one of those rare times when the Deathwing deployed at their full strength an event unlikely to occur more than once in a century. They tore into the commons of Chaos Sorcerers on the asteroid with righteous fury, inflicting dozens of casualties even before the Chaos forces knew what had hit them. Moments later, the Dark Angel's boarding torpedoes struck, and with incredible swiftness, the asteroid was engulfed in a battle of its own. Help was also at hand for the revenge, a silvered strike cruiser arrived alongside the Dark Angel's fleet, and a full brotherhood of Grey Knights materialized within the Revenger's hull to cut a sway through the Demon Legion swarming through it. They were soon joined by contingents of Dark Angels, aiding the defenders and stemming the tide of the Chaos boarding party's attacks. As the covens on the asteroid died, the portals through which the demons were appearing closed one by one. Hunting parties led by squads of Grey Knights wiped out the last of the demons lurking within the ship. Within hours, no taint of the incursion remained. Although she had been dreadfully damaged, the revenge was saved and would continue her vital role in the Pandarax campaign. All around Gaia, the story was the same. The arrival of the Dark Angels swiftly turned the tide against Chaos. The first to feel the Dark Angels' avenging fury was the might of Huron, which was blasted into oblivion by the combined firepower of the unrelenting fury the attack squadron launched from the Stormwood. Meanwhile, Warlord Iron Grasp found his ships trapped between the battered but still combat-worthy ships of Battlefleet Demeter and the newly arrived Space Marine strike cruisers and escort squadrons. Surrounded on all sides, Iron Grasp attempted to break through to the relative safety of the adamantium fields, but his fleet, already damaged in the earlier battles around Gaia, could not succeed. Only half of the ships in the Chaos fleet survived the battle, and those that did were so badly damaged that it took many years to repair them all. Tragically, Admiral Cranswar was slain when he laid a defense detail against the renegades that invaded his flagship, and he did not live to see the fruits of his victory. The triumph of the Imperial forces in space was almost total, leaving Abaddon and his Black Legion trapped and cut off on the surface of Pythos. The Reconquest of Pythos, Year 960, Millennium 41 if Abaddon was worried by this turn of events, he showed no sign. In the months since Pythos had been invaded, the planet had become a demon-infested hell. Greater demons reveled in battle against the Saurian monsters that inhabited the planet, and hordes of lesser demons marched on the Delva strongholds. Whenever this gibbering army reached one of the mountainous fortresses, it launched a furious attack aided by contingents of Black Legion warriors and Red Corsairs sent by Huron Blackheart to aid Abaddon's forces. Although the defenders of the strongholds put up a valiant resistance, they could not hope to hold out for very long. One by one, the strongholds were overrun and any survivors were marched back to Attica as slaves. What the slaves returned to was not the city that they once knew. 
located so close to the corrupting force of the damnation cash, Attica had changed beyond all recognition. Strange, hideously mutated structures had sprouted from the once elegant spa walls. Most of the city had been abandoned, and the population now lived in a network of twisted underground tunnels and caverns that surrounded the damnation cache. Vile smoke and putrid vapors filled the air in the tunnels and belched out through cracks and crevices into the surrounding atmosphere. Most terrible of all, the enslaved population of the city had been struck down by a terrible plague that rendered them to shambling creatures more dead than alive. It was this grim scene of devastation and despair that greeted the victors of the space battles in the adamantium fields. Finally arriving in orbit above the planet, the Imperial fleet immediately began orbital bombardments onto the demonic armies that were assaulting the Delver strongholds. Squadrons of Marauder bombers intensified the bombardment, aided by Xerxes' airborne support wings and Dark Angel's Thunderhead and Talon of Vengeance squadrons. Abaddon's forces were driven back by the overwhelming aerial barrages, allowing companies of space marines and regiments of Imperial Guard to relieve the defenders, many of whom had been fighting continuously for over a year. In a brief ceremony, Colonel Strike officially handed over command of the planetary defense force to Commander Azrael of the Dark Angels. Colonel Strike refused all orders to join the other high commanders in the orbiting battle fleets, preferring to return to the fray in his specially modified Baneblade, Traitor's Bane, so that he could fight against the invaders who had cost him so many men. However, although the tide was turning, the Chaos armies continued their relentless assaults on the Delver strongholds. No sooner was one strike driven off than a new one would begin. Abaddon's tactics changed. Instead of making overwhelming and methodical attacks against the strongholds closest to Attica, his legions, supplemented by hounds of Huron raiding parties, attacked wherever the defenders were weakest. No matter how Azrael organized his forces to react to these attacks, he could not always arrive in time. Many smaller strongholds were overrun and their populations enslaved. It quickly became clear to Azrael that firefighting in this way was leading nowhere. He had to strike at the source of the problem. The damnation cache itself would need to be recaptured and resealed. In truth, the Grey Knights accompanying the Dark Angels had been arguing for just such a strike ever since the fleet had arrived over the beleaguered world. Although the Dark Angels harboured a bitter hatred for Abaddon and his allies, Azrael argued that the first priority of the Emperor's armies on Pythos was to shield and protect the plant citizens. Therefore, the Delver strongholds should be saved before Attica was attacked. It was only when it became clear that Abaddon's forces would continue to launch sporadic attacks against the strongholds, no matter how well protected they were, that Azrael was forced to change his tactics. Assault on Attica, Year 961, Millennium 41 Once the decision was made, the Imperial forces acted quickly to bring the Emperor's wrath to their demonic foes. The assault on Attica was announced by a massive orbital bombardment. The once gleaming Spire City toppled to the ground, and the surrounding area was pounded into wasteland by the combined firepower of the Imperial fleet. In the wake of the bombardment, Thunderhawk gunships and drop pods crashed onto the ravaged battlefield, disgorging the full strength of the Dark Angels chapter. Supported by the Grey Knights, who had saved the revenge, even the Black Legion and the hordes of demons at Abaddon's command could not resist such a hammer blow, and they were quickly driven underground by the fury of the Imperial attack. The second wave of the assault swiftly followed. Scores of orbital transports landed around the bridgehead the Space Marines had established, disgorging regiment after regiment of Imperial Guard onto the steaming mire left by the orbital attack. Colonel Strike was one of the first to land amidst the ruins of the city. The hoary survivor had been given command of the Imperial Guard assault army 
by Azrael himself and was determined to see the campaign to its brutal conclusion. The Imperial Guard regiments arrived not a moment too soon as wave after wave of vile demons poured forth from the ravaged underground tunnels, having scented blood. Many Imperial Guard platoons and their accompanying armoured support had only just mustered in their position at the perimeter of the bridgehead when the demon horde struck. Laz guns and battle cannons tore, gaping holes in the charging ranks of demons, but as one infernal creature fell, ten more stood ready to take its place. Soon, the whole Imperial front line was engulfed in a terrible melee, as Guardsmen and Space Marines battled furiously against creatures spawned by the warp. Bayonets were fixed and chainsaws activated in a desperate defense against the talons and blades of the demonic host. Then, the guns of the orbital Imperial fleet fired into the warp-spawned horde. The massive macro cannon shells and strikes of their lance batteries smashed into the ground dangerously close to the hand to hand combat being fought all around the bridgehead. Each titanic blast lifted scores of bodies into the air to fall amongst the swirling combatants. Even as the warp spawn demon horde could not withstand such hammer blows and against the massed firepower of the fleet, the attack faltered and finally stopped. Around the implacable space marines, the weary, wounded guardsmen drew breath, relieved to see tunnel mouths empty and quiet. All around the bridgehead, the ground was covered in the slowly dematerializing remains of more than 100,000 demons. Within an hour, the bodies were gone, returned to the realm of chaos that had spawned them. They left the battlefield eerily barren, strewn only with Imperial corpses and the blackened shells of wrecked tanks. The Underground War With the bridgehead established, Azrael began the grim task of clearing a path to the damnation cache itself. The underground tunnels and caverns were defended bitterly by newly summoned demons and chaos space marines under Abaddon's command, but the Imperial attackers were implacable. The cave system was vast and incredibly complex. Tunnels branched and intertwined, some of them narrowing so that even infantry could only advance in single file, while others were so massive that they formed vast underground caverns large enough to allow death strike vortex missile batteries and hunting packs of warhound titans to bring their long range weapons to bear. Unnumbered battles and firefights were fought within the Stygian darkness below Attica. But slowly, yard by yard, the Imperial forces battled their way through the darkened tunnels. As they closed in upon the damnation cache, the demons and chaos space marines were joined by shambling hordes of mutant zombies. They were the surviving remains of the once proud citizens of Attica, enslaved ever since Abaddon had captured the planet and now horrifically transformed by the warp effects of the chaos portal. Gritting their teeth, the Imperial attackers forged on through the foes, every step taking them closer to the damnation cache itself. Even though the situation around the cache was becoming increasingly desperate, Abaddon continued to launch raids on the Delver strongholds, even leading several of the attacks personally. Azrael, however, no longer allowed this to distract him from his purpose. Spearheaded by the Dark Angels and Grey Knights, the forces of chaos were driven ever further back until the damnation cache was almost in Imperial hands. However, just as Abaddon seemed defeated, a fresh flotilla of Red Corsair's raiders suddenly appeared in the system. Breaking through the Imperial Cordon, they rendezvoused with Abaddon in the jungle, and their orbital transport craft quickly evacuated the surviving Chaos Space Marines from locations scattered all over Pythos. Although the Imperial fleet was able to destroy some of the Red Corsair transports, the majority made it to the ships hidden in orbit and escaped. Hours later, an Imperial assault seized the damnation cache and the Grey Knights began the arduous process of re-establishing the wards that would seal it once again. The Pandarax incursion had finally been defeated, but at huge cost. 
aftermath. In the wake of Abaddon's escape and the resealing of the Damnation Cache, the Dark Angels and Grey Knights left Pythos. Colonel Strike was left in command of the two Imperial Guard armies that had taken part in the Reconquest and has been fighting a decades-long campaign to cleanse the planet of any lingering demonic infestation ever since. Although the Damnation Cache was resealed, the damage it inflicted was severe and many minor warp rifts still need to be closed. The war carries on to this day. Why Abaddon attacked the Pandorax system remains a mystery. However, there are recurring rumors that his aim was not one of conquest, but of discovery. It is said that the ruinous power sent Abaddon a vision, which revealed that, hidden among the population of Pythos, he would find a powerful psyker whose latent abilities would ensure victory in his coming crusade against the Imperium. Decades later, the Dark Angels heard whispers that a mysterious psyker of prodigious power had ordered the capture of an artifact known as the Hellfire Stone. These rumors were confirmed when a Dark Angels force clashed with Chaos Renegade searching for the artifact on the Imperial planet of Bane's Landing. In his sanctum, Azrael remembered the campaign he had fought against Abaddon all those years before. Perhaps, he thought, as he made the connection. Abaddon was not defeated on Pythos at all. Perhaps he had left because he had acquired exactly what he had been looking for. <laughs>